Help us to make good decisions for our people. Bless the people that is here. Bless the council. Bless, bless our communities, Lord. And uh, just be with us as we go through this day. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Janelle Fulbright? Here. Bill England? Bill John Baker? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Harley Buzzard? Here. Julia Coates? Bill Crittenden? Here. Jody Fishinghawk? Here. Meredith Braley? Here. Don Garvin? Here. Gore Jordan? Chris. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Curtis Snell? Here. Chris Soap? Here. David Thornton? Kara Callen Watts. Oh, honey, we do have a form. Uh, next to business is the approval of the minutes. Do no. we have any additions or corrections to the minutes? Move for approval. Second. All in favor of approval of the minutes, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Minutes are approved. Uh, in reports, uh, we have the uh, Claremore Service Unit. Uh, Mr. Valeria, I don't think, is here today. So uh, next is uh, Melissa Gower, and she's going to give us a report. Uh, George Valier, the CEO at Claremore Indian Hospital, had to be out of town this week. And so he did send you a copy of his report. And if you have any questions on it, I can write them down and email him, or you can email him, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You also have a copy of my report. and. Um, what I had asked at the, or promised at the last meeting was that I would have uh, Brett Hayes to come with me today and do a short uh, presentation on contract health services. So um, if that's still your pleasure, he's here and has his PowerPoint up and ready to go, and I'm going to catch him right here and turn it over to you. and have him to do a, a short presentation on contract health and then I'll entertain any questions you might have. And so this is Brett Hayes, if you have not met him, and he is the Director of Contract Health Services for Cherokee Nation Health System. Brett, you're on. And here you have this here. Where are we going? I just need to go. Okay, I'm Brett. And been here almost five years. Seems like about two. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whirlwind. Now, uh, <laughs> I give it to the guys who broke on. Okay, here. Basically, the, I'm going to hit the high points of Indian Health funding, contract health funding, Cherokee Nation contract health, how we operate, along with some cool maps that the GIS people did for us. I'll just I got those in there, and I'm going to have more of those to come in the future. Uh, I didn't realize how kind of neat things I could do with those. Uh, first is IHS funding. There's two kinds of federal funding. One's you guys know this, but one's discretionary and one's mandatory. We're in the discretionary side of things, so we don't grow with population. Uh, go ahead, Adam. I'm sorry. Now, across the last time they, they've compared these numbers, I think JT says the White House told them to quit doing that. The uh, per capita for Indian spending was 1914 versus 5,085 across the nation. In Oklahoma, that number is actually about just about half that, which is $976, which is significantly less. Okay. That's that's 44% of their need. The, the big number is 50% of Medicaid spending, 33% of what's spent on the VA, and 200% of federal, or federal prisoners. Now, that's for IHS in general. If you go to the next slide, it shows how, how that compares in Oklahoma for Oklahoma Indians. Uh, Medicaid people, they spend four times more basically on Medicaid than they do on Indian Health. They spend 400% more on federal prisoners. Uh, I, I always say that if, if we got the same amount for Indian Health care that the VA gets for formulary, it would be great. <laughs> so, that's it. CHS 
is one of the bigger shortfalls nationwide. When it comes down to specialty care, uh, cardiologist, oncologist, things that cost money to hire, uh, it becomes a CHS issue. The national shortfall is 120 million. Oklahoma represents half that, effectively. This is a ranking of area per capita funding. The, the ranking is about per capita funding for CHS. And if you see Oklahoma's at the bottom at $207, and that's for inpatient, outpatient, all CHS funds. So that 65 million, out of, out of that 65 million, we get about 13.1. So we, we're well below Billings, Portland, and the Tucson area. IHS es estimates our uh, level of need is we're funded 25%. So when they do certain funding, we might get more than another, another service unit because of that. We looked at, in looking at some of the Claremore stuff, we get $67 per user at the Tracings unit, and the Claremore Indian uh, Hospital unit gets 45 and that's Sometimes I, CHS funding does not, I don't want to say it's not logical, but we can't figure out why the variances are. <laughs> uh, CHS funds step in, as I said earlier, when the tribe or the Indian Health Service Tribal or Urban Center is not able to provide the services, they refer it out. Uh, used and typically used for when there's an emergency or there's a specialty care need, there's an overflow of workload, or there's no, no facility. Uh, I think that may be one reason Billings and those do well is they, uh, you know, there's not a lot of facilities in the local area. We hold the status as the payer of last resort. That means when, if there's an accident, if there's a workers comp case, IHS by statute goes to the end of the line. We're behind Medicaid, we're behind workers comp, we're behind uh, any kind of insurance. So we do hold that status and I have to remind vendors about once a month that you can't balance bill. A Medicaid patient, you know, you've got to accept what Medicare pays, and you have to accept us as a, as a, as a Medicare level payment. Our policies focus on getting that, holding our status as payer last resort. Uh, our staff are trained to try to make sure that if somebody got hurt on the job, to, you know, funnel that through the workers' comp system. Uh, that a lot of times that'll, that can be confusing. Some of the specialists we don't have, uh, urology, oncology, neurology, neurosurgery, all those, you know, urology is one that I didn't think it was that big of a, a need in the region until we started realizing that we, it was hard to find urologists to uh, treat patients. So we, we really were working on that. The Concord Health Service, Service Delivery Area, you'll hear it called CHESDA. It's your CHESDA. And in the state of Oklahoma, there's 20 different CHESDAs. Uh, if, if typically it's designed for reservation, the reservation mindset. Uh, you have to live on, if you live in Arizona, you have to actually live on that reservation to be eligible for Indian Health, contract health services. In Oklahoma and Nevada, if you're in the state, you're eligible because you're considered an Indian country. And we have, if you'll see, you'll see the map, this is what we call the contract health quilt. It's a lot of cool colors, but you'll notice that northeastern Oklahoma has a lot of the most confusing, and you guys deal with this day to day, the there's 10 different, uh, I guess, Chesdas or mixtures of, of a Chesda based upon the 14 county boundaries. Uh, and that map's not, that's the map IHS did, and it's not 100% accurate. It's got some uh, interesting, interesting things. So it'd be really neat to be, or not neat, but easier <laughs> from a contract health point of view to be purple because there's no, there's not a lot of variance. It's all one, one color. Okay, go out. Now, this is what GIS did for me, and I just got this Friday, and it's a really cool. I've got the map, and I'm going to get it out to you guys with your local a map, local to you, where you can look down at the street level and see where people live and where it stands with regard to the county and the 14 county area. Uh, I didn't think that Elizabeth, the lady in GIS, was going to do to this detail. It's really neat. But you can look at, say, in Muskogee, you can see where the boundary goes through, what streets it goes through on, and you can understand then uh, when a patient's eligible for services that maybe are uh, general fund services through the 14 counties, when they're not eligible for uh, contract health because they live in maybe, maybe, maybe it's an inpatient, they live in Muskogee County. So 
it's interesting. Now, the, the rest of these, we might go through these fast because you can't see a lot on them, but this is a maps that we're having worked up for all of the district, different districts. Uh, you can see that's one, two, and three. We have the inpatient and outpatient for those three counties. Uh, this is McIntosh and Muskogee. That's McIntosh. <laughs> uh, and you guys know the boundary down there. It's, it'll, it'll sneak up on you. It's bigger than you'd think. And I, I, I look up Muskogee a lot just because we have a lot of people that live on that boundary. They live 100 yards on the right side, 100 on the wrong side. You know, it goes, it's an interesting... Oh, you need one? Oh, how about that? I'm good. <laughs> now, this, this, I just, I have all these maps and I want to. Oh, here. Fred, can I interrupt you for yes, just a sec? Can you go back one? Because I've got a big question about this deal over in Muskogee. Uh -huh. uh, this man called me and he said that he lives within the Cherokee Nation boundaries mm -hmm. over on the right streets by a few blocks. And. He was told that he had to go to uh, Creek Nation, that the whole county had to go to Creek Nation regardless of whether you were in Cherokee Nation boundary or not. And then Nation. he was referred out. He needed surgery to, uh, for orthopedic surgery, and Creek Nation denied his contract health and sent it over to Cherokee Nation contract health. Is that the way that works? That, I don't know. I'm not familiar with well, that. Well, that's the way it works. It's in, in, in an inpatient surgery. Uh, whether you live in Weber's Falls or you live almost up by Bigsby, Creek Nation has the inpatient authority. Cherokee Nation has the outpatient. Uh, so the only thing they, they did wrong is they wouldn't have sent him back to us. That's... Okay, well, what, I mean, what does he do? I mean, they said they... He said that they put the creeks ahead of him, you know, so. Well, that's, we. And there's nothing. There's nothing we can do. I mean, he needs to appeal. Okay, well, I didn't. I, know. I this, when, this was all news to me. Like, I'm new, so. Well, and when it comes I'm down to. I'm glad you're explaning all this. Because and when it comes down to orthopedic surgeries, you know, and that's one thing we'll cover a little bit later. Uh, we saw a lot of things being denied that we'd like to approve. Shoulder surgeries, orthopedic, you know, uh, knees, things that that were significant, but they didn't, when you start lining them up with medical priority, you know, cancer, uh, heart, all that stuff, before you got to the end of it, there's no money left. So all inpatients? All inpatients from Muskogee County. Go that to that leads Nation. over into your area with the Weber's Falls. Okay. You know, there's a little bit Maybe of Maybe Mr. Garvin yeah. understands all of it already, but I don't. Because when they told me this, I, I said, well, that, that's news to me. I don't know. So and, it, I, and, you know, it impacts. You're answering my question. So. Yeah. It impacts, it impacts a little bit of everybody. You know, the Creeks then, if, if a patient lives in Weber, if they have an outpatient heart cath, that goes, they have to, it goes back to, or, I'm sorry. If they live in, say, up by Bigsby, there's a little bit of Muskogee County up there. That comes back to us. Are we going to approve it or not? And so they have to sometimes come set up charts in the Scobie Clinic or Hastings and kind of get into our little network as if they were one of our day-to-day -day patients for the CHS purpose. We have that with Miami. Uh, you know, Ottawa County has some things. We have Claremore Union Hospital has a lot of our a lot of the inpatient. Pretty much 412 and north goes to Claremore for Indian for inpatient. Well, I'm trying to understand this, but like, if you're going to Three Rivers Clinic and mm -hmm. you need, say, shoulder surgery, right. and it's going to be outpatient, it would still go through Cherokee Nation. Mm -hmm. But if it was well, inpatient, inpatient means in the hospital right. overnight. If you're, if you're in the hospital more than 24 hours, it will go through Creek Nation. Right. That's right. Okay, I think. And Somebody, uh, Deputy you know, Chief Girl, Joe Grayson tried to explain this to me once, but I didn't understand it. But maybe I'm beginning to see it. I would have liked to see him, you know, 30 years ago when they did these divided things up to use, you know, a lot of times it's easier with a with a real barrier, a river, a highway. But so instead of dividing Muskogee County, maybe not in a logical manner, they said, you know, inpatient, outpatient. Okay. And and historically, you know, 20 years ago, a lot more. Things were were actually inpatient. We're, the more healthcare expands and gets more efficient, things 
hospital doesn't want to do things outpatient. They get paid better from insurance companies, and so you're seeing the, the, the bubble move a little bit more towards outpatient. So but that's we have Muskogee, uh, well, Wag, Wagner, and McIntosh County are all in the other somebody else's jurisdiction. While there may be a part of them that's in ours, their contract health goes somewhere else. But Muskogee and all the counties in the north are split inpatient outpatient. Well, that's so confusing to all those people because they certainly don't understand. I'm glad that in Sequoia County we're all just Cherokee Nation, but no. they were trying to explain all this to me, and I said, I don't know. So you cleared it, cleared no, it up. Well, it's not to get too clear because it's never. We can get contract health people in a room and start talking about jurisdictions and everything. It can get. I'll sh we'll go to. I'll show you a slide that's interesting. Okay, there. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Can you get these maps accessible a lot bigger? Yes, I want to get them. I want to. Buy, I want to get them by. Them yeah. Get them accurate, they're still working on them. Yeah. Some of them are a little not quite accurate yet. Once yeah. we get those spot lines, then we'll give you a copy. Yes. Of your yeah. Because you're really neat. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there a way we're going to post them online, so folks? Because I think that might help answer questions. And because I know I take up a considerable amount of Mr. Hayes' time. <laughs> and this might be one way to alleviate some of that staff on these kind of questions. We can attempt to able. do that once we get our health page up and updated. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Go down one, one more item. This is odd a little bit. This is, if you'll notice, this is the biggest area that we got all confused on. If you look at this map, and you know, you guys know this is Grand Lake, you can live in big cabin, and you can actually physically be in Mays County, but you have an Afton mailing address. Because of the way the 911 addresses came in around the lakes, it's, it can be, you can live 12 miles from Afton and have a have an Afton mailing address, pay your taxes in Mays County, and because of the way IHS, the IHS system works, you're a, you're a, you're a Afton slash Ottawa County patient. It's a mess. And Langley is the Langley is the example we use with IHS on how things can get a little confusing. And you know, you type in an address on MapQuest in the Grand Lake area, and it'll take you. There's no telling. So we really have to work with it. But it's 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 a challenge. But actually, it goes by the address, not where your physical home is. It should go by your physical address. Now we take the stance that we use we use the map, and we'll use the United States Postal Service. They have a website that's pretty good because it'll tell you what county it's in. It's not. It's, it's in the 99 percentile, but there's, around these lake areas, it can get confusing. And generally, we'll take the benefit of the doubt. You know, we have, we have a larger population to, you know, if Miami says we're not going to see them, we'll treat them as one of ours, even though we theoretically could push it back. That's kind of been our, over the last two or three years, that's been our stance, and it's not hurt us. So, this is just kind of continuing on the maps. Keep, keep rolling through there, right? Now. We have 35 employees doing the administrative work, which is all the payments and processing the stuff for Hastings Hospital and all the six, six clinics, actually the eight clinics, but only six of them have CHS offices. We manage the referral process, uh, including payment for, we had over 35,000 referrals in the last 12 months. We had 3,100 denials in the last 12 months. We've been kind of going around and doing some, looking at some other tribes and seeing how they do things. Uh, the Chickasaws had, they do about 175 referrals a week. The Creeks do about 215. Uh, you know, we our average is 680, 700, just on referrals per week. We review, we'll get into that a little more. We review about 500. So, our funds from IHS are 3.1 uh, for CHS funding. We, uh, the general fund. This year was 6.2. That brings us a total CHS budget of 19.3 million for this year. <coughs> this is just some historical. When I started, I started doing this spreadsheet, and I didn't, I wasn't planning on five years from now doing it this way. But it kind of tells the, the story of the referral and how how our system has grown in the clinics to this point. We, you can see, there's a significant upward trend. And it, it'll, the next slide is on, this is total referrals, and this is on approved referrals. And uh, I think a statistician would tell you there's a higher slope there. But I don't. <laughs> and the next slide is on denied referrals. That, that made more sense on an annual basis. But you can see that we've gone down, and we've had a little more this year. I think it's just historical kind of growth. 
And this one, this was interesting. I did this, and this is a percentage of denied referrals. So you can see the percentage of referrals we see every week that are denied has steadily gone down. There's some variability there, and uh, but historically we're we're at a downward trend. We're, you know, doctors are writing good referrals. We're getting better information, and it's uh, it's a positive trend. <clears throat> okay, the referral process. The primary care provider. That's a me that's a center care term that we've. Well, it's a medical term, but they use that for uh, Medicaid too. Our docs have, they'll be a primary care provider and they will see the patient and they will determine if they think a specialty consult or some kind of specialty treatment is necessary. <clears throat> now, one thing to know about the PCP is a lot of times we'll get issues from you guys that the patient needs a referral and we'll start looking and the patient may not have us as his Medicaid PCP. So, our, our referral system says if, since we're the payer of last resort, if John Smith comes in for, uh, he needs a shoulder surgery, our doc says, yeah, I, want, I think this is a good idea. If his, if we're not his PCP, that referral is going to be sent to, like in Tahlequah, there's a, there's a guy downtown that's another, he's a Medicaid primary care provider, and it's auto-assigned. He can, the patient can auto, the patient can opt out of that. They can call and say, this is John Smith. I want to change my primary care provider to you know, Cherokee Nation. And then any any Cherokee Nation doctor is, could be his primary care. We, we as an entity are the PCP. So that can be something that if, if the patient has Medicaid, you might ask that. And make sure, and they can change it within a day. They can call an 800 number and they change it and it's it moves things along better. Yeah. Good question. Yes, but I'm also hearing that some folks are taking eight months, nine months, up to 18 months to get a primary care position at Well, that's that's separate from the the that piece. That, the, that's that nothing with the Medicaid. That has nothing to do with the contract health system. Okay. But you are correct uh, in that, and I think we talked about this last month. Mm -hmm. We're working on that, but. Uh, they can call and just say Cherokee Nation is their PCP. Okay. And whether they go to an assigned PCP at Hastings or through walk-in for the current time, it still would work. Okay. 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 The doctor believes that the patient needs a, ref a referral for specialty care. He writes that referral and he makes the medical priority on there by using our system. That referral is then sent to CHS. Now the, the staff there then they look at the referral and determine is it something that I'm going to go ahead and approve and schedule now, <clears throat> and we'll get into a little more later on how so, or does it go to for review? Uh, this is the point that we should offer this patient. You know, we, we see you have you know sometimes we'll see patients with two or three insurances, and you know would you like to go ahead and schedule that? So that that's 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 the point where we're, we're supposed to offer that. Right. And it may, that it may not be paid. And a lot of times it's a patient that, you know, they're going to pay, they have a $10 copay. Would you want to go ahead and schedule this? And if it's not approved, do you pay the copay? Or, you know, that's a question that come, you know, comes up often. So, uh, oh, it changed on me. I thought it changed. No, that's okay. So, that's good. Go ahead. Okay. Disoriented. Those, those referrals come in weekly and they're reviewed by the medical review board. Uh, we did. We do. We we've moved up slowly to where we're between 450 and 550 now per week. Uh, they're approved, denied, or sent back to the provider for further information. A lot of times, there's. It's it's clear that maybe this is a referral that we might want to refer receive, but we, sometimes it might be better to send it to Hastings or to send it to Claremore, you know, for uh, MRI or an MRI for CT or something. Yeah, that, that's, uh, is this review board, is it all one entity? Or is it's meant for our medical <laughs> medical doctors. Right, but I mean, is it, is, are they reviewing 100 apps a day, basically? They, uh, review. they review once a week, <coughs> there's about 500 referrals they Okay, so this group of people sits down and goes through 500 apps? Well... For an eight-hour period, or...? What happens is that if... if they do it on a weekly basis, so they take all the referrals for that week for review. And the CHS staff, prior to the review board meeting, 
puts them in bunches, you know, piles. Like this is for all diagnostic testing, this is for this, this is for this. That way they can go through them fairly fast and be able to just knock them off. So it's about a half a day process, maybe sometimes a day process. Four to six gen hours, Four to six you know, depending hours, on. Yeah, to do a lot of times it's comparing, you know, you might have 18 uh, values. You compare, you know, which ones, which ones look more medically appropriate. Uh, yeah, so a lot of times it goes back to what's written on that referral. And the referral serves a couple of purposes. One, it's one, it's saying, here's the care I want for this patient. Uh, it's the way, if, and if we get this patient to the specialist, that's going to be what he sees, he or she sees as, this is what Dr. Jones wants to have done on this patient. So it's a it's a dual purpose, the, the text and the referral. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Uh, and Brett, I, I mean, I understand that when they, they come in, they've got two or three insurances. You know, you say, can we go ahead and make the appointment for you? You know, you're going to have to pay a $10 copay or you know, whatever. But, you know, if they've got Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, $10 copay, why don't we just approve them and pay the 10 bucks? Well, when they have Medicaid, that there's never a question of whether they're going to pay, but we don't, you know, it's, it's, but I mean, I've got people that have insurance, but they will sit there when they need services and wait for contract help. I know, and, I've, and when it's all said and done, we don't pay anything. Yeah. I mean, we get the bill and say, hey, Medicare already paid it. That's all we contracted for. You're good. We don't pay anything. Uh, and I just, why can't we just, instead of having 800 denials of people that have the Medicare or Medicare and private insurance and, and stuff, and just, boy, go, go forth and broaden. And if we're out 10 bucks, we're out 10 bucks. The reason that we don't do that, I'll answer for Brett. Yeah. <laughs> the reason that we don't do that is because our CHS system is based on medical priority. And it's not based on whether someone has a payer source or not. So if they have, if they, if the, if it meets medical priority, then we approve that. If someone has, and I told Brett this morning, I mean, I don't even send mine through CHS. I just, the doctor tells me I need to go somewhere and I tell him to give me a referral and I just go do it. So if people have payers and they want to pay the $20 copay, which is fine for me, then I just go do it and stay out of the system. And people have that option. But if they want that $10 paid, we cannot move them in front of someone just because their copay is $10. It has to be based on medical priority. But could we put some tribal funds in to just clear the system a little bit with those kind of people? Well, I don't know that it clears the system because it's based on what it, you know, what is, I mean, a hundred of those is going to be a thousand dollars, which would pay for someone that has a higher medical priority to go to the, to get the service that they need. I mean, we're dealing in a lot of quantity. I know we are. And, that, and that's why when I say clear the system, I'm, I'm, it would, it would knock out, you know, so much paperwork, so much stuff, so much denial, so much this, that, and the other. And, and we know that, you know, if they've got a pay source, that it's not, it's going to virtually cost us nothing. Well, but, if it costs us nothing, we process them. Okay. If it's going to cost something, it has to meet medical priority. Yeah. If there's no cost to us, we're processing them. We're making them appointments and getting them out there. Yeah. Well, I just, I mean, I've, I've had people from time to time that we find out that they've got a pay source and and we go ahead and get them. But, like with cancer and stuff, I mean, time is, you know, it's well, going to end up costing us more in, in the long run if we don't get them. Uh, right. Well, treated early. I mean, cancer does meet medical priority. Yeah. So those are being processed. Yeah. I wish they were getting denied before the process. Mm, for cancer? Uh, I'd like to send you the yeah. name of the person that got yeah. denied for that. 
Yes. My only comment is that there's 70 percent of the referrals are approved on appeal. Then why are so many people being denied? They should be approved to start with. Okay. There's several reasons for that. One of them is, and I asked Brett to talk about that, and he's not gotten there yet, so maybe if we let Brett finish, then it might help answer some of the questions. But just to answer a little bit of that, for example, on emergency rooms, you know, people will go to an outside emergency room because they truly had an emergency and they were taken to the nearest emergency room. That happens a lot. I get a lot of emails from you all about that. Well, when they call that in to contract health service, all that contract health service has to make a determination is someone calling in saying they had to go to an ER. That's it. They have no medical records. They don't know why they had to go to that ER. They don't know all of those things. So they're automatically denied. And then on appeal, if the patient gets their medical records and writes an appeal why they had to go to that ER and those kinds of things, then most of those are approved on appeal. That's a big reason. It's because of the information that they have on the first shot is not enough information to make a decision. Melissa, do we have the ability to identify the patients that Counselor Baker just alluded to? He alluded to a scenario in which we've got numerous citizens or a citizen that is waiting for a donation to pay a $10 copay to receive medical benefits. And so do you have a way to take a snapshot? I'm not saying just really do an in-depth analysis, but just a snapshot to say yesterday 20% or what the percentage of those patients that fall into that category? Do we have that? We can probably, I don't know if we have capacity in our system to pull something, but what we could probably do is consciously monitor it for a day. You know, do a study for an eight-hour period. Or for the 500, or I don't know if there's anything that would skew those results or anything, but just on a weekly basis or whatever. How do we determine what percentage of our patients in the CHS system have additional pay sources? Well, we can do that through just the, I mean, we can tell you what percentage of our patients have a third-party payer. And then you can extrapolate that to CHS. So could you assume, if that's the case, could you assume that it wouldn't, not necessarily every situation would be a $10 copay, but it would be somewhat similar. Well, some of them are copays. Some of them are copays plus deductibles. I mean, it depends on the individual person and what kind of coverage they have. Okay. I was just curious if we had the ability to not really study it, just to take a snapshot and say, hey, it is 50% of our citizens, or if it's only 10, then that's different than, you know, that's kind of a special case versus actually having a minority that meets those criteria. If you take a snapshot of CHS, a lot of those patients aren't going to be included in CHS. Like Melissa would not be included because she goes out on her own. Right. And that's why it's interesting to me that the percentage of people with copays that don't ever access the CHS system because they just assume they have themselves, they have their knowledge, they don't have the boxes. We do track, we do a monthly review of all the transfers out of Hastings from an inpatient point of view. And out of those, anywhere between 60, 65% have a payer source, either Medicaid. But that's going to be inpatient. Right. That's inpatient. That's a whole different story because then you're talking about paying 20 to 30% of their coverage. I'm saying from a snapshot point of view. Yeah. That's a sicker population. So it's going to be a little higher. We'll see what we can do. We'll work. Because it would be interesting to know that if we're talking about one or two unique cases, or are we actually talking about a higher percentage of 25 to 30% of the people are in part of that category, then it may be worth pursuing. And I think from a contract health 
point of view, just as, as the way the federal program works, is typically people wouldn't want to treat people differently based upon their payer source. They want to, you know, is this is this medically appropriate or not? Yeah, I, I think that, that we we agree with that. Yeah. It just it, it'd just be interesting for uh, for people, the citizens, to know that. Uh, Maybe sometimes people do wait for that ten dollars, or they do. I don't. Up to two hundred. I've, I've seen it. I mean, I don't. I mean, it's not a uh, urban legend. And some of them, it's just because they're not thinking outside the box to say, you know. I mean, some people probably qualify, like you said, for center care. Mm -hmm. They say, I'm going down there and waiting at Hastings for five hours, and, and it's like, well, you could have yeah. went and got center care and waited five hours at a different uh, <laughs> doctor's office, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. But, but people don't um, you know, think like that all the time. So I, it'd be nice to know what we'll see, I think we can run some. We're, we're working with, uh, and that's one of the reasons we went down to Chickasaw Nation. They have a, a consultant that works with them on pulling out some more data and using some different Just reports. a snapshot. It so, yeah, I think that's something to look at. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, we review the referrals. Uh, they're approved tonight or sent back for further information. They're scheduled and the patients are notified. Uh, the denial letters go out with an appeal form, uh, and those appeals are actually reviewed weekly also. And a lot of times, you know, when you're looking at 500 pieces of paper and trying to get it done in a day, you, you, you can't see as much information as when you're looking at maybe 30 appeals that, you know, where A, there's, medical, there's more medical information. Maybe there's a copy of the, the MRI report for a shoulder surgery. And the, you had the patient saying, "Here's how it's impacting my life." I, I could, you know, we had we had one recently where, uh, you know, it's, it's grandparents working, you know, being able to help raise their grandkids, you know, foster parents, all kinds of good. You know, there's, there's some reasons you want to approve some of these things, and that doesn't come across in the first pass because there's just no there's no way to look at 500 referrals and do that. So. I have a question. Does each clinic do their own reviews? Are, are they all done at the central location they're, weekly? They're all done centrally. They're all done centrally? Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's uh, some group that's just a review board that is right. separate from the medical providers that have to go through this. Yes. Because a lot of people call me and they think that the, I've even had them the council reviews it, you know. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't me that wasn't letting you have your MRI. It's, you always, it's always a medical doctor. Right. <laughs> so, but nearly everybody down in... We just don't time. want to take time away from the providers. Yeah, well, they think the that it's some little select group there in Sequoia County that's going over there and they're yeah. like, this one or that one. So I want to be able to tell them it's done in it's a simple location. It's a very location. objective review okay. by, by someone that is not at that facility. I'm learning, so thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, next is a summary of our conceptual Go ahead. I know. Can, you, can you guys read the, the, the services that are automatically, automatically approved by medical priority? You can see those in there. They're, uh, Inpatient transfers, emergency services not available at Hastings. The dialysis, there's any number of. These are the list of services. It's on your slide on page five, your fourth slide, summary of medical priority. These are the services that, the that um, have an automatic approval. So they don't have to go before the review board. Um, and those are things that are unavailable at either a Cherokee Nation or an IHS facility, um, high risk OB, cardiology, um, inpatient services that are unavailable, pediatric cancers, uh, uh, lots of pediatric things, and then some adult cancers. So those can be approved on site at the CHS office immediately. Those do not require review board approval. 
the next slide is the referrals considered weekly, uh, the review board referrals that go before the review board. Those are diagnostic studies, uh, evaluations, consults, and follow-up visits. Um, and then Brett's made a note at the bottom of that slide that says in the past 10 years, the number of these referrals have grown from around 150 per week to almost 550 per week. So, and that's just because our health system has grown so tremendously. You know, we've added lots of new facilities, lots of new doctors, um, lots of new mid-levels, lots of providers from where we work. And then the next slide is the summary of medical priorities. These are services that are typically excluded from authorization. So these are types of services that contract health does not cover. Uh, don't get many questions on these, but every once in a while there are. Um, I've gotten a couple on transplants and cosmetic type things, but. <laughs> In the last, yes. In the last four slides are the eyeglass program, which is you guys are familiar with, uh, prosthodontic, which is dentures. Dr. Hacker uses that, I think, to maybe learn how to spell it. And the return to work program and the medical resource program. Those are all programs. When I talked about the uh, general fund programs, those are all programs <coughs> included in that. Uh, so. And the last page of your packet is a list of contacts, and I think, we, or the next to last page, I think we've handed this out before, but this is a list of all of the uh, contacts for the Contract Health Services Program. Um, so it might be helpful to you if you have a patient that goes to Wilma P. and they're calling you about a CHS item, you can refer them to Gina Fletcher and give them her phone number. Um, and she could uh, try to assist them. And then your last page is just a handout. Um, I think a few of you asked for this. But this is, a, um, this is one that was uh, specifically uh, being used at Hastings. And the other ones are all at the other facilities are very similar, but they have their names. So what we're trying to do now, and Brett's going through this, is to delete the names of the facilities and come up with one that's generic that we're going to use across the system. And once he does that and has a whole CHS packet that's generic, I'm going to bring you all back the packet and give it to you. But for now, this is the type of information that's given to every CHS patient. I think some of you ask if they get information about, you know, is it going to be paid for, is it not going to be paid for, is there a chance, that kind of thing. And so this kind of goes through that for the patient that you can see that. We'll have your maps and other stuff with that too. Is there any questions on CHS or, or mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. on health services? Yeah, I've got one more follow-up question. As far as the timeline, um, if, if I'm going and apply for contract health services, and then, um, can you kind of just walk me through real quick what the, the average timeline is? Or you know, some people are more efficient than others on getting field letters in, or maybe not turning it in until later or whatever. But what, what's that look like? Well, now if any referral, if it, say a referral was written this morning. Uh, that we, on Wednesday afternoon at five, we close that off, and then we can, you know, if Charlotte from Salina calls and says, "Hey, I'm, I'm, I'll be done in 20 minutes," we'll put that back. We might do it on Thursday morning, but we, on Thursday, we run all the reports that were written from Thursday to Wednesday. We print those all out. We estimate the cost. We look at, uh, you know, we sort them and put them in order, and then Friday the the review board meets, and they, you know approve or deny based upon medical stuff. Now, that can vary based upon schedules. It may be, it, we may do it on Monday occasionally. We may, you know, we may do it on a Thursday occasionally, but usually, typically, it's done on Friday. They're, they're notified on a Monday. We, the way we're doing it now, we, we scan them, PDF them, and put them on the server, and then they, they can then print those out, and they sort through them, you know, they prioritize them, you know, internally. Out of the, say, 50 out of Salina, I was, you know, they're going to go through and pull out the, I want to schedule these first because these are the ones that are pressing. 
and they, they'll schedule them all, and then they'll send out their, their denial letters. So if a referral is written today, I would expect uh, by next Wednesday that would be scheduled, and they'd be calling you to say, hey, I've got this appointment scheduled for you. Uh, you, you, know, you come in and give me a come in on the next time you're around here, get the, you can pick up the referral. And I think a lot of times there's some go back and forth about uh, scheduling dates and times and stuff. But that's, and I think we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of growth and we're trying to look at some ways to remove some of the workload in the clinics to help them be a little so, more. So are you saying that, that from a one, there's probably a one week period by the time you get notification that they've been approved there should or be, denied? There should be about one week. Okay, well, so depending on anywhere from anywhere from uh, let's say if it was written on a Thursday, it could be okay. So let's say two weeks, seven to thirteen days. And then the clinics are responsible for ensuring that that mail out goes out to the to the uh, constituent the patient, and that's where the the bad addresses sometimes uh, comes into play and things like mm -hmm. that. So then that's another uh, so four weeks. If you haven't heard something after four weeks, they should call. Then they call should me. Be Concern. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Stanton. Uh, for instance, if uh, a doctor said Jay sends a patient to Grove Hospital, mm -hmm. he's real sick, and you got to go. You know? mm -hmm. How does contract health play in it? Well, if I'm going to go with the patient living in Delaware County for this. Uh, that would be an emergency type situation. It would. The, Approval or denial would go to Claremont. For, for Delaware County, they have inpatient and emergency. So uh, we might, if it was one of our doctors, did, are you talking about one of our doctors right there? Yeah. Okay. There would be a referral in the system that said, you know, I sent Brett Hayes to Grove. I was thinking he was, you know, having a heart attack. I sent him to Grove. And that referral we then sent to Claremont for them to address. So how does this fall down to the system where it breaks down? Or like I have assistants call and say, we got a letter from the collecting agency saying that we've been to the hospital. And Jay sent us, but they won't pay the bill. Contract help refuses. Well, if it's if it's a if it's an emergency for Del for Delaware, if it would, because it was an emergency, then it it it's a Claremore Indian Hospital contract health function to either pay or deny. So it's not a, well, even though we sent them, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a Claremore jurisdiction issue. So they're not, we refer them to Claremore. Right. For the contract health service question. Right. Yes. Jody, are you next? Oh, okay. This is kind of off the subject, but not really. Can you get me, I was looking at your numbers and the money. Can you get me your unobligated balance and your unspent balance? You are talking about the 19.3 we put in there and budget's coming up and I just wanted to ask you to. Okay. I don't have it, but I can, I can Yeah, can just get an email, please. Yeah. Okay. We can have our accounting office. Okay, I just wanted the unobligated versus unspent. Okay, thank you. Councilor yeah, Blaser. And, and Brent, just to follow up on Councilor Snell's question, uh, even though the doctor sends you to the Grove Hospital and it goes to Claremore, Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily it's going to get paid just because the doctor sent you. Right? Correct. How does it work here with Hastings? If if I go to Hastings and Hastings sends me to Hillcrest, yes. if I live in Cherokee County, uh, you know that goes into our system. And if that it's you know it's our it's our determination. Are we going it to pay works or not? the same way. It's just who administers that CHS program, whether it's Cherokee mm -hmm. Nation or whether it's IHS. Well, I guess my question would be this way. Does Cherokee Nation handle those referrals different? If a doctor at Hastings Hospital says you need to go to Tulsa to an orthodontist on the weekend, would it necessarily okay that you're going to be paid or is there still some uh, questions about it? If, if it's out of the emergency room, we, you know, we treat that as if it was our doctor referring that. I mean, if it was out of the Hastings emergency room. If, I, if I'm at a softball field and I'm get lightheaded and fall down, that's going to then be re re reviewed for medical appropriateness. Uh, it, kind of, it, it varies in, in our jurisdiction. We, we treat it, uh, you know, we, we consider going through Hastings as a 
we had the opportunity to I think the answer to your question yeah. is that Indian Health Service medical prior Indian Health Service has a medical priority list, okay, that they use across the Indian Health Service system. Cherokee Nation has a medical priority list because we operate the program under self-governance, so we can set our own regulations, our own policies. If your question is, are those medical priority lists different, the answer is yes, they are. Well, that was part of my question, but okay. the other question is, if I go to the J Clinic and I have maybe a... Uh, a heart attack. And that doctor said, well, you need to go to Grove Hospital, Harlan. <clears throat> and so some patients are taking that. Since that doctor told me to go to Grove Hospital, it's automatically paid for. That's not the case. That's not the case. And I think that's what the curse is referring to. Just because yes. the doctor sent you to Grove Hospital, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get paid. A doctor refers based because you need the medical care. Yes. They don't even they consider whether it's paid for or not. Well, that's for a they lot of are medically obligated, Dr. Brennan, you can answer this, but they are medically obligated to refer you to the most appropriate medical care. Whether it is paid for or not through the CHS system is something totally different. Yeah, and that's where the confusion is. A lot of patients go to our clinics okay. and the doctor says, well, you need to get to the hospital right now. Well, they just say, well, it's going to be paid for, so they don't. Then they get a bill, and they say, well, they referred me over there. So I, I understand the system, but a lot of people certainly don't. Thank you. Any more questions? Would it be, and this might be directed towards Melissa. Melissa, would it be a possibility that this little one-page thing here might could be sent out to our, our uh, patients at the clinics in the hospital so that, you know, I get the same thing that Harley's getting. A lot of them don't understand that. And I'm thinking of one case in particular where they went to our Kaduki clinic out here and they were told to go straight to another hospital because it was a, it was a, um, unusual situation. The medical condition was unusual. And they didn't tell them to go to Hastings. Well, they got the idea that it was covered. And then they were in there for like 30 days and were not able, I mean, they were not in a physical condition to notify anybody of anything because it was like a life or death situation. And they didn't, you know, nobody even thought about it. But maybe if we would send this out by family, possibly, our household, maybe the cost would be too much of a deterrent. This seems to me to be very straightforward and understandable that if we sent this out to the households, possibly that would alleviate some of those problems. At least they couldn't say they didn't know about it. I, I don't know what the cost would be. If we did it by household, maybe it wouldn't be too much, but I would certainly encourage you to maybe think about that and even post this in a large poster type at each clinic and at the hospital. I think one of the things that Brett's working on, and we just talked about this recently, is almost turning that into a brochure for contract health that talks about that, plus all the programs that are things that we have available uh, to have available in all of our health centers. So, we're definitely going to do some of that, but we can look and see what a cost would be, or maybe we could get um, the church of Phoenix to credit or something. Like you still have that. those isolated incidents you where are. if they go comatose or something of that nature, mm -hmm. and physically they're just not able to tell anyone, look, we need to notify the proper mm -hmm. people, you'll still have a few isolated incidents like that, life-threatening situations. but. This might, if we posted it, put it in the newspaper, sent it out to each household, it might cut down on 90% of the questions that we get. Just a thought. 90%? Well, maybe not 90%. <laughs> Each Christmas says it won't be 90%. But, but at least it'll take care of some of them. Sounds good. Spirit.
based on the statute you provided, the denials are there. Okay. Still, there is a considerable difference. Is your plan or how do we overcome that? Efficiency. I mean, we try to get the best rates we can. You know, we've got a pretty big operation, and I think our, we, you know, the catastrophic program is one where every case over $25,000, you can submit to IHS for reimbursement. It's basically like that $25,000 is your deductible, and they'll reimburse everything over that. We've got a significantly larger operation, but we didn't have, we don't have as many catastrophic cases. I think because we pay less, and we pay $20,000 where another tribe might pay $35,000. So we're doing everything we can. We have, you know, favorable contracts. Our overall strategic plan is that we continue to lobby Congress, which you guys are very helpful in that arena, and Indian Health Service and the administration to increase the appropriated dollars. I mean, that's the problem. We're funded at 25% of the need. And there is, in the FY10 budget, an increase for contract development. So, in fact, in 2009, we got a little bit of an increase. So we see that trend start to go up a little bit, and every little bit we get is going to be very helpful. So that's our overall strategic plan. And then we do lots of things as, you know, I think Brett runs a great shop. We probably have one of the best contract, as complicated as contract health is, and make no bones about it, it's complicated. But as complicated as it is, I think the Cherokee Nation runs one of the best ones in the country. And it's because we've done a lot of things. You know, we try to negotiate good rates. We get in networks. We, you know, put clauses in our contracts. We go out and build relationships with people. We, you know, do all those kinds of things that helps us get in economies of scale because we process so many referrals. And so people want our business, so it's easier for us to, you know, negotiate better rates and those kinds of things. So your efficiency rating and all of that plays into those negotiations, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, there's areas that we're still trying to improve on. Brett has a, Dr. Green gives him an improvement plan every year. Opportunities for success. Thank you. She calls him and checks on him. So we continue to try to have efficiency in our program. But our overall goal, which you all can help with, is to lobby Congress for more money in CHS. Well, we're running a little bit behind here, so we need to wind this up as soon as we can. I'm done except for your questions. Okay. We won't take any more questions then. You have done a really good job and answered a lot of questions for us. And I've been asked to announce that the pictures for this afternoon have been canceled, in case everyone doesn't know. Okay. Thank you. To move to adjourn. No. Oh, no business resolution. Oh, Dr. Cobb is out of the country, and he asked me to co-sponsor this with him. It's a resolution authorizing the submission of the Indian Health Service Tribal Management Grant application. I move it be approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, same side. Resolution passed. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Okay, we are adjourned. Let us talk. Five minutes. Close the sub. So we can get finished.